right. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming out on a nasty, rainy afternoon here in Washington. Um, this is obviously uh, an inherently interesting subject for those of us who pay attention to Kazakhstan, but uh, it does seem that a larger percentage of the world is paying attention to Kazakhstan this week. And in fact, to some of the very questions that Maria will address having to do with what constitutes an appropriate national capital and how one names a national capital and other very timely subjects. So we're really very fortunate. This was obviously not pre-planned. We did not receive a memo in advance um, on, on uh, Nazarbayev. Uh, but Maria has promised me she'll be uh, open to answering and discussing all manner of related questions. Uh, before I introduce her, uh, I want to just note a couple of upcoming events uh, that you may be interested in. On March 28th, which is Thursday next week at 3 o'clock, uh, we have a book launch event with Rachel Saltzman, who is a visiting scholar at SAIS um, and uh, a former colleague of mine uh, when I was at Carnegie. It's on BRICS, Russia, and the Disruption of the Global Order. Um, and then Monday of the following week, so April 1st at 2 p.m., we have a book launch on uh, The Tragedy of Property, which is uh, by Max Trudelubov. He uh, edits The Russia File, which is our blog that will, by the way, also talk about Kazakhstan. I think we have a very recent piece on Kazakhstan on the blog. Um, and, uh, and Max is a very well-known uh, commentator on Russian uh, domestic politics and, and related issues. All right, so with no further ado, uh, Dr. Maria Blackwood, for those who don't know her, is a Title VIII research scholar here at the Kennan Institute focusing on uh, the history of Soviet Central Asia. Um, she's uh, spent time in Moscow as an Alpha Fellow um, working at the NGO International Memorial. Um, her scholarly work, uh, among other topics, examines the process of elite formation in Soviet Kazakhstan, uh, exploring political power dynamics within the Soviet Union and its successor states. Um, for which research and other work she's received grants from the American Councils for International Education, Fulbright, SSRC, uh, and Harvard's Davis Center, as well as others. Um, her PhD uh, in history is from Harvard uh, last year, uh, and her MA and BA is from Yale, uh, and she's worked on uh, international arbitration cases involving the Russian Federation for an American law firm in Paris. Uh, but wisely chose not to go the lawyer route. That's a decision I can <laughs> respect, having been tempted in both directions. Um, but the really uh, exciting and slightly disappointing for those of us who are her colleagues here news is that she will be starting uh, next month as the Congressional Research Service first ever uh, resident expert on Central Asia. So she will be responsible for educating Capitol Hill about this vitally important region um, at, I think, a really fascinating moment. So congratulations, Maria. Um, I'm going to give you a round of applause for that. We're sorry to see, we, see you go, and we're going to make you sing for your supper before you do. <laughs> All right. uh, well, thank you very much, Matt, and uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for being here today. Um, the research I'm going to talk about today comes out of uh, my larger project on elite formation uh, in Kazakhstan in the early Soviet period. Uh, and it, in that larger project, I examine questions like um, what kinds of people became Bolsheviks in the context of early Soviet Kazakhstan, who made it to the top of the party hierarchy, and how, how does understanding personal histories and personal relationships contribute to our understanding of the creation of Soviet Central Asia. And this particular topic I kind of stumbled across as I was um, examining those broader questions. Uh, so one of the things I'm going to argue today uh, is, again, something I kind of came across very fortuitously in the archives um, because it kept coming up. Um, and it was not something I set out to research, um, but I found it really fascinating. Um, and what, one of the arguments I'm going to make today is that um, the fact that the Bolsheviks were dependent on a very small administrative elite in Kazakhstan in the 1920s and 30s had very important um, ramifications for the republic's political landscape uh, in terms of the people who were available to work in party structures. But it also had an impact on uh, the republic's actual physical geography. Um, so this is a map of uh, Kazakhstan uh, in the 1920s, uh, from 1920 to 1929. Um, and uh, it shows the various territories that um, 
became part of Kazakhstan, ceased to be a part of Kazakhstan. Um, but for our purposes, what's interesting is that it shows uh, the three capitals, um, the three cities that served as capitals of Kazakhstan between 1920 and 1929. Um, so first, Orenburg, which is uh, in the northwest in the, the area that's in green, um, which was the capital from 1920 to 1924. Uh, then Kizilarda, which is in kind of the center uh, towards the south, um, and then uh, until um, uh, 1929, and then from 1929, Almata, which is in the southeast, the city that's today uh, known as Almaty. Um, so they're marked by red stars on the map. I'm not sure how visible it is, but um, so yeah. Um, so as I mentioned, in the first decade of its existence, Soviet Kazakhstan had three different capitals. Uh, and several other cities were considered as potential centers for the republic. These relocations, first from Orenburg to Kizilarda and then from Kizilarda to Almata, were undertaken despite the fact that they were expensive and logistically complicated. So why did Soviet authorities undergo the difficulty and the expense of relocating the administrative capital of a sparsely populated republic, not just once, but twice within the span of nine years? So usually capital relocation uh, is understood um, as an exercise in top-down identity formation, uh, a means of redefining the civilizational identity of a country. So in, in, in scholarship, it's very much associated with nation building, uh, and most recently, especially in the context of decolonization. Um, and it's usually seen as very much a symbolic move and very much a top-down decision. Uh, so for instance, here we have some uh, examples of capital relocation that you're probably all familiar with. Um, the move from Moscow to St. Petersburg under Peter the Great was very much kind of a statement about redefining the identity of Russia and the Russian Empire. Uh, the move from Istanbul to Ankara uh, underscored Turkey's identity as a secular nation state after the demise of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, the move from Rio de Janeiro to the new city of Brasilia was uh, meant to distance uh, Brazil from its colonial past. And even in the context of the Soviet Union, um, we see capital relocation in this more kind of top-down mode. Um, most famously, the move from Petrograd to Moscow and also the move from Kharkiv to Kiev, um, which were both the result of top-down decision-making and were meant primarily as demonstrations of strength. So what about Kazakhstan? Um, in the 1920s, the Soviet Union was very explicitly engaged in what could be termed a nation-building project. Soviet nationality's policy focused on determining the contours of various ethnic groups, establishing specific territories for each recognized group, and promoting literacy and cultural output in local languages. So we might expect that in this context, the decision to move a capital would fit this general pattern. But in the case of Kazakhstan, uh, the agenda for capital relocation was actually very different. Rather than coming about through centralized decision making, it resulted from protracted negotiations between various interests. Although Kazakhstan's capital relocations were retrospectively used uh, in official rhetoric to promote the idea of a Soviet Kazakhstan, I argue that the motivations behind the decisions to move and the choice of capital were not those of nation building. Um, so Kazakhstan's first capital, Orenburg, uh, became the capital essentially by default. Um, and then it proved unworkable for Kazakhstan's communist elite because of the highly contentious relationship between the republic-level party apparatus and the city-level party organization. So consequently, um, in 1924, it was decided that the capital of Kazakhstan would move elsewhere. Uh, although it was discussed in broader terms of decolonization, this first decision to relocate Kazakhstan's capital cannot be abstracted from the interests of the small political elite who drove the decision making. After the decision to leave Orenburg, Kazakh party authorities engaged in protracted attempts to obtain Tashkent, uh, and they presented this as um, kind of the typical nation building project usually associated with capital relocation. But despite their very persistent and very adamant efforts, uh, they were unsuccessful in, con in convincing Moscow that Tashkent should not become uh, part of the Uzbek SSR, uh, although at that point it was not yet the capital of Uzbekistan. Uh, 
So instead, um, Kazakhstan's capital was relocated to a small provincial uh, administrative center in Sirdarya Oblast, a city that was known as Akmichit or uh, Pirovsk in Russian, um, and it was soon renamed Kizlarda, so it went from being a white mosque to red capital. Um, Kizlarda once again proved unworkable for the party elite, uh, in this instance because the city's harsh climate and deficient infrastructure made it a very unpleasant place to live. Um, in early 1927, less than two years after Kizlarda uh, had become Kazakhstan's capital, it was decided that the Republic's center would move again, this time to the far more temperate city of Alma-Ata. Although the move was not enacted until 1929, it was clearly motivated by concern for the material well-being of Kazakhstan's administrative elite. Um, what's interesting is that while these relocations do not neatly fit into the nation-building framework usually associated with capital relocation, um, they're actually very similar to um, the practices of European colonialism in places such as uh, British India and French Indochina. Uh, especially when it comes to con uh, concerns about the material well-being of um, a small administrative class. Uh, but it's also important to note that the elite Soviet authorities were concerned about in this instance uh, was very different in, in terms of its composition than, for instance, um, you know, French administrators in, in, in Indochina. Um, so the history of Kazakhstan's capitals illustrates um, that the Soviet Union was a state that could at once be explicitly anti-colonial in its rhetoric, um, while it was nevertheless replicating patterns associated with European imperialism, while at the same time empowering local elites. And this contrast between um, capital relocation in Kazakhstan in the 1920s and kind of the, the usual model of capital relocation as a nation building project is heightened when we look at the further fate of Kazakhstan's capital, uh, which is something I'll return to later on. So you updated the slide. <laughs> Um, so when Soviet Kazakhstan came into being as an administrative entity in 1920, its first capital was Orenburg, um, which is a city that, as you can see, is today in, in southern Russia. This was a legacy of Tsarist-era administrative structures and um, a consequence of civil war considerations, rather than a result of any kind of deeper connection between Orenburg and um, the Kazakh steppe. And here again, you see Orenburg in the context of Kazakhstan in the 20s, and it's in the far northwest in the green area. But from the beginning, uh, Orenburg proved to be a problematic capital. The relationship between the city-level party apparatus, which was well-developed and predominantly Russian on the one hand, and the Kazakhstan-level party apparatus, which was much less mature as a political organization and much more diverse, uh, was highly acrimonious from the very start. So once the Civil War um, died down and Soviet rule became more firmly established with uh, the official promulg promulgation of the Kazakh Republic in 1920, Kazakh communists almost immediately began lobbying uh, that the capital be moved. And rather than advocating for a specific alternative, uh, they were primarily concerned with uh, leaving Orenburg. Uh, so here you see uh, some of their complaints uh, about uh, why Orenburg um, was not suitable uh, as a capital for Kazakhstan. Uh, one thing they, they brought up quite a lot was that it was kind of an artificial center as a capital of Kazakhstan, that it was not sufficiently Kazakh, uh, that there wasn't really anything Kazakh in Orenburg. Um, they also brought up logistical difficulties connected to its location in the extreme north of the republic, and this became especially salient uh, with the national delimitation of Central Asia in 1924, when Kazakhstan gained a lot of territory in the south. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, there was the highly contentious relationship with the city-level party. Um, there was a lot of resentment on both sides. Um, the primarily Russian um, party operatives um, who, who had been in Orenburg before and who had a much more kind of um, developed party experience, uh, resented um, the, the fact that they were now subordinated to this new republic. Uh, as one official put it at the time, the Orenburg proletariat should not submit to peasant shepherd Kazakhstan. Um, while the Kazakhs um, thought the, uh, the Russian, the primarily Russian party organization in Orenburg was uh, exhibiting what they termed Russian colonialism. 
Um, so in fact, the relationship was so contentious between the two sides that even the process of separating Orenburg out of Kazakhstan um, was very acrimonious. Uh, looking at the documents, it looks like a, an exceptionally messy divorce. Um, so the uh, officials on both sides, the republic level and the city level, engaged in protracted arguments over the division of property, such as uh, office furniture, the projector from the movie theater in Orenburg, um, archival materials, library collections, and horses from the state stables. And even as late as 1929, you still have angry letters from both sides going to Moscow complaining that, you know, Kazakhstan took the, the wrong books from Orenburg and um, demanding that they be returned. Um, but even before the uh, ultimate decision um, to leave Orenburg was undertaken, Kazakhstan's party authorities were confronted with uh, the question of where to relocate. So they knew they definitely did not want to be in Orenburg, but they didn't know where they wanted to go. Um, because Kazakhstan's territory was pretty vast and sparsely populated with no major urban centers, there was no obvious front runner. So they considered a, a wide range of cities, um, such as Omsk, uh, Vierny, which we now know as Almaty, Semipalatinsk, Uralsk, Aktyubinsk, Kustanay, Turgay, Shymkent. Um, but actually, for quite a while, they were very adamant uh, that Tashkent should be uh, the capital of uh, Soviet Kazakhstan. Um, which is interesting, but there is a certain logic to it. Um, Tashkent at the time was the most developed city in Central Asia. It had served as the administrative, cultural, and economic center of colonial Turkestan, uh, and it had also benefited from significant infrastructure investments in the Tsarist period. So Kazakh party officials hoped that relocating um, the capital of Kazakhstan to Tashkent would kind of jumpstart the republic's development and modernization. It was kind of a shortcut. Um, and what's interesting is that in trying to convince um, central party authorities in Moscow that uh, they kind of d deserved Tashkent, they were essentially arguing for their own backwardness, and they were pointing up the fact that they were so much less developed. Um, and uh, they actually made some interesting claims about uh, colonial oppression of the Kazakhs by the Uzbeks as yet another argument um, as to why um, Tashkent should become uh, the capital of Kazakhstan rather than becoming a city in Uzbekistan. Uh, ultimately, they did not succeed, um, though they did try very hard and for uh, quite a long time. Um, they even at one point said, you know, even if uh, you won't let us move the capital there permanently, at least let us relocate temporarily. Um, but it didn't work out. Um, even as they were trying to get Tashkent, though, uh, Kazakhstan's party authorities continued to discuss other options. And so the broad criteria that emerged over the course of these discussions were um, that Kazakhstan's capital should be located uh, in a city that is preferably centrally located, um, but more importantly, a city that could be construed as Kazakh or close to the Kazakh population. That's something they brought up a lot. Uh, but most importantly, and this consideration trumped all others, um, was that it had to be connected to railroad infrastructure. Um, again, Kazakhstan is very big. Uh, at that point, um, there was no really easy way uh, to get around um, other than by rail uh, that would not involve um, traveling for, for really extended periods of time. But even within the confines of these broad considerations, there were no obvious front runners. Um, and that's, that perhaps explains why, even after they decided to leave Orenburg, um, there was no immediate decision as to where they would go. So finally, uh, they settled on Akmechit, um, which uh, was also known in Russian as Perovsk. Uh, and it was confirmed by um, the Central Committee as Kazakhstan's new capital in January 1925. And it was subsequently renamed uh, Kizlarda. Uh, and her here again, you see it in the context of uh, the 1920s, kind of in the middle in the south. Um, the considerations that led to Kizlarda's designation as Kazakhstan's capital were purely technical rather than symbolic. The city was more or less in the center of the republic, and crucially, it was located on uh, the railroad that connected Tashkent to Orenburg and Moscow. So on paper, at least, um, Akhmetchet appeared to be a promising location for a new capital. Compared to most of Kazakhstan in the 1920s, um, it was well connected both to other cities in the republic and to the rest of the Soviet Union, both by rail and also by water routes, because it's right on the Sirdaria River. But the new capital very quickly proved disappointing to Kazakhstan's officials. 
At the end of February 1925, only after the city had already been designated as the future capital, Kazakhstan's Council of People's Commissars sent a commission to Akhmichet to assess the city's current state and lay the groundwork for relocation. They discovered that there were significant infrastructural deficiencies. The city lacked a sewage system. Uh, there was chronic lack of running water due to infrastructural problems. Only the area around the train station had electricity and the streets were unpaved. There wasn't enough housing or office space for the influx of officials who were expected to move uh, to the new capital. There also weren't enough schools or teachers to accommodate their children. Uh, inflation in the city was very high um, and the price for uh, food and other basic necessities uh, jumped quite considerably, um, driven at least in part by the fact that there was almost no local agricultural or industrial output to speak of. Um, the city also had a very harsh climate with a lot of extreme temperature fluctuations. It was very cold in the summer, or in the winter, uh, and then in the early summer, um, the Serdaria would overflow its banks, flooding significant portions of the city. Um, the summers were very hot with uh, a lot of mosquitoes, which is something we perhaps can empathize with. Uh, and the city was also notorious for its dust. Um, so this is a, an excerpt from a memoir um, by a young party official who was sent to Kizlarda um, in 1926. Uh, and like everyone else, he, he uh, pays a lot of attention uh, to the dust. And the, the, um, so he says, a storm of dust would follow us everywhere, even indoors, there was no salvation. The dust crowded into apartments covering the window sills. Billions of dust particles glowed in the window panes. Um, and so this was apparently very unpleasant, and it was also seen as uh, detrimental uh, to the health of uh, residents of the city. So all of this meant that it was difficult to live there, and it was also very difficult to convince people to move there, even though they were promised all kinds of incentives. Um, so there was actually a lot of uh, very vocal disappointment with Kizlarda once it became the capital uh, in a lot of um, different venues. Uh, so there were uh, newspaper articles um, in Kazakhstan's main daily newspaper kind of complaining about how terrible it was. Uh, it was discussed in closed party meetings. It was written about by um, the Commissariat for Labor as a significant problem. Um, so here you see some of, uh, some of the things they were worried about. Um, the complaints about uh, dead dogs, cats, crows everywhere uh, on the street, heaps of manure uh, and trash, um, mosquitoes, flies, dust again, um, the unsanitary conditions. Um, and uh, all of this made it very unpleasant and, and therefore kind of impractical um, as a capital. What's interesting is um, that there's a very clear comparison in terms of how um, Soviet officials were complaining about Kizlarda um, to uh, kind of attitudes uh, we usually associate with European colonialism. So the, these complaints are actually very similar uh, to Russian attitudes towards Tashkent in the Tsarist era. Uh, and they're also very similar to complaints and anxieties voiced by European officials in places like Africa and Indochina. So ultimately, the city's climate and the resulting problems in accommodating and attracting administrative officials played a decisive role in the decision to move the capital out of Kizlarda. Uh, and they officially made that decision in March 1927. Um, the uh, Central Executive Committee of Kazakhstan decreed that given the local economic and uh, natural historical conditions, and the fact that, quote, in connection to the construction of the Frunze Semipalatinsk railway and the prospect of extending the railway in a meridional direction, the city of Alma Ata will acquire the importance of a major economic point linking the economically powerful regions of northern and southern Kazakhstan. Uh, the capital should be moved to Alma Ata. Um, so uh, you see it there in uh, southeastern Kazakhstan, um, today known as Almaty. Uh, and again here in, in the 1920s. Uh, Alma Ata was much larger than Kizlarda. Um, at the time of the revolution, its population was about 47,000, whereas um, in Akhmichet, before it became the capital, uh, the population was about 6,500. And some construction would be required uh, to accommodate uh, the new capital, but party and state institutions um, had a lot of existing buildings they could make use of, and the housing situation was also much more promising than it had been in Kizlarda. Um, moreover, and I think most interestingly, uh, Almata had a reputation as a very pleasant place to live. 
Um, in fact, the uh, administration responsible for constructing the Turksib Railway had successfully lob lobbied uh, to move its headquarters from um, uh, what is now Bishkek uh, to uh, Almata because of uh, because of the the climate, and they. Um, had this very evocative phrase in their letter to the Central Committee saying that, you know, if it's not a paradise, then it is at least a demi-paradise. Um, so when, once the decision to relocate was announced, uh, there was a series of lengthy articles in, in the press extolling the virtues of its climate uh, and placing it, again, in very stark opposition to Kizilarda. So in a 1927 memorandum compiled for Kazakhstan's Council of People's Commissars on the transfer of the capital, um, there's a very clear emphasis on uh, the city's favorable climate and geography. Um, so they talk about how the city can be called a garden city. Um, there are large tracts of forests and warm sulfur springs that um, it will be possible to con construct sanatoria, that people already come um, to the area in the summer. Um, and although the, the decision was undertaken in the first months of 1927, uh, the actual relocation of the capital was put off for logistical reasons. At that point, there was uh, not yet a direct rail link between uh, the two cities. Um, but it's very clear that uh, party authorities were eager to leave Kizilarda because um, they, they tried to move uh, even before the railroad was completed, but um, Stalin told them they had to hold off. So in the end, the, the government arrived uh, in the summer of 1929, um, just a couple of months before the completion of the railroad. Um, in 1935, um, there was a kind of a new plan for the city um, that uh, announced that it should be reconstructed as, quote, a model capital of the East. But even once it was given this kind of new symbolic importance, um, the pleasant climate in Alma'ata continued to be a defining element of um, how the city was portrayed. So uh, although it does not represent the only example of capital relocation in the Soviet Union, uh, Kazakhstan was the only Soviet republic to have three capitals in the space of nine years. To place this peregrination in perspective, 13 countries um, have relocated their capitals since the 1950s, and that includes um, Kazakhstan's move in 1997 from Almaty to Astana. Kazakhstan's capital relocations in the 20s are notable not only for their frequency, but also for their motivations, which depart from the generally understood model of capital relocation as a nation-building project. So instead, the discussions and decisions surrounding Kazakhstan's capitals uh, demonstrate the degree to which Soviet authorities privileged technical considerations and were dependent on a small administrative elite within the republic. Um, and as such, they, they bear some resemblance to the attitudes of European colonial states. The difference between capital relocation in Soviet Kazakhstan and the predominant nation-building script is underlined by the further fate of Kazakhstan's capital. So in 1997, um, Almaty, as Almaty had been renamed in 1993, ceded its position to the northern city of Akmola, uh, which was rechristened several months later as Astana, uh, a name that means uh, capital. And as you may have seen, very recently has changed its name again, uh, this time to uh, Nur Sultan. Um, this relocation uh, was widely understood and in fact very explicitly presented as a nation-building project meant to underline the country's post-Soviet sovereignty and to bolster Kazakh identity. Uh, what I find really interesting is that, in a sense, the designation of Akmola as Kazakhstan's new capital was almost an exact reversal of the move from Kizlarda to Almaty in the 1920s. So Kazakhstan's newly independent government chose to move from a well-developed city with an agreeable climate to a remote, inhospitable region of the steppe. Um, the city's earlier Kazakh name, Akmola, uh, is commonly translated as white tomb, um, which is perhaps a reflection of its highly unwelcoming climate. Um, the average high in January is about four degrees Fahrenheit, as opposed to about 22 degrees, I think, in Almaty. Uh, and in the warmer summer months, the city is overrun by mosquitoes, a byproduct of its situation on a swamp. And here, I think, again, we can empathize. Um, fierce winds make the winter temperatures feel even colder and give rise to dust storms in the summer. At the time of its designation as Kazakhstan's new capital, Akmola lacked modern infrastructure and also had poor housing stock. The move was expensive and broadly unpopular. Moreover, uh, at the time of the move, there was concern that the city was on the verge of a tuberculosis epidemic. Uh, 
Nevertheless, these factors did not deter the relocation of the capital, precisely because it was understood as the cornerstone of uh, the Kazakh nation building process. As one observer noted in 1998, no matter what harsh conditions nature imposes, they are no obstacle to determined politicians, to their visions, and to their engineers. So in Soviet Kazakhstan in the 1920s, those visions and determinations were markedly different from the nation-building motivations usually ascribed to capital relocation projects, and in fact, to the capital relocation project that Kazakhstan itself undertook in 1997. Um, the example of Kazakhstan's three capitals demonstrates the degree to which um, what Mark Beisinger terms the Soviet practice of performing sovereignty could coexist with colonial patterns of administration, and it underscores the fact that Soviet authorities were highly dependent on a small administrative elite in the republic. Uh, moreover, it, it illustrates what Russian anthropologist Sergei Abachin has termed the contradictory, ambiguous, and complex character of the Soviet. Uh, where you had room for both inequality with attempts to overcome it, um, colonialism together with anti-colonial practices, et cetera. Um, indeed, as historian uh, Adib Khalid, um, who argues generally that um, the comparison uh, of the Soviet Union to 20th century European colonialism doesn't work because of the USSR's agenda of cultural transformation and modernization, he concedes that the Soviet state, quote, could not completely vanquish the habitus of empire. The messy process of selecting a capital for Kazakhstan reveals the role of the Republic's administrative center in the first two decades of Soviet rule as fundamentally technical rather than symbolic. Ultimately, the factors that uh, mattered in determining the capital of Kazakhstan were the working conditions of the party elite and the existence of a rail connection. Um, so it's interesting to note that scholars have long uh, considered uh, the railroad as uh, an important technology of imperial rule, serving to further modernization, uh, economic development, and kind of the general project of uh, the so-called European civilizing mission. Um, and in the Soviet Union too, railroad infrastructure was really key to the Bolshevik conquest of Central Asia and later to Soviet industrial development and social transformation in the region. Um, but what I think is really fascinating is that railroad infrastructure was a necessary but not sufficient factor uh, for determining kind of what an acceptable capital was. And I think that underscores um, some kind of fundamental things about the nature of power uh, in the Soviet Union in the first two decades. Uh, in the short term, Kazakhstan's capital was functionally defined as the physical seat of the political elites uh, because the Soviet administrative apparatus was um, very much dependent on specific individual political actors rather than on broader um, political institutions. Uh, and again, I think this is a really interesting contrast to um, what has happened to Kazakhstan's capital uh, since independence, and it really underscores the difference between um, Kazakhstan as an independent nation state versus Kazakhstan as a, a Soviet republic. So, thank you. Well, thanks very much, Maria. Um, I, I think uh, it, it may jump out. You, you made a few very uh, apt references to our ability to empathize with uh, uh, Kazakhs relocating themselves to Akmola um, because we sit on a swamp, but I think we can empathize if we go back another 250 years to capital relocation itself, right? New York, Philly, Washington, uh, also an artificial creation. Um, I find myself wondering over and over, why can we not be in Philly or New York? But <laughs> leave that as it is. Uh, I'm going to ask you, I'll, I'll ask a, a question here to get us started, and then we'll, we'll have time to take questions from the room, and we'll still wrap by 4 o'clock. So let me give you that dry run that I'm sure you're craving for your future job, which is the utterly unfair and impossible predictive question that you will get on Capitol Hill. So taking into account everything that you know uh, about symbolism and nation building, uh, the, the ways in which... Um, you know, the, the capital city might reflect where things are headed. Um, when you consider the environment around Kazakhstan today, especially the great powers to its north and south, right? You've got Putin and his possible designs for orchestrating uh, some type of post-2024 scenario that might involve mucking around with borders. You've got Chinese Belt and Road that might involve some types of uh, connections, let's say, running through neighboring countries that certainly do. What does 
the the status of Kazakhstan and its new capital, newly renamed capital, Nur Sultan. I mean, what does that tell you about where Kazakhstan's going, both externally and internally now today? Um, so I think um, the the relocation uh, from Almaty uh, was broadly understood, and I, as I mentioned, actually very explicitly um, uh, presented as a nation building project. And you see that very much in the landscape of the city uh, in how it's branded. Um, but there were also other uh, considerations that people um, brought up at the time. So one being, uh, again, I guess out of interest for the uh, material well-being of the administrative elite, um, Almaty is in a very seismically active area. <laughs> so uh, and th th they have no earthquakes um, in Astana or Nur Sultan. Uh, but the other, the other issue um, that a lot of people raised at the time was the fact that it's further north um, and kind of shifts the center of political gravity of the country. Um, towards part of the country that um, is less ethnically Kazakh. And uh, some people at the time understood it as um, kind of securing uh, Kazakhstan's uh, coherence in that sense, but precisely by shifting the center of political gravity to uh, a, less, um, a less Kazakh area. Um, I think um, it's, it's interesting to see what the reactions within Kazakhstan have been to the renaming of the capital. Um, it, it, I think it didn't come as a surprise. This is something people had um, talked about for a long time, uh, that it was probably going to happen at some point in the future. Uh, the same thing actually happened uh, in Almaty. One of the main streets uh, in Almaty was renamed, um, uh, I guess, maybe a year and a half ago, um, from uh, Furmanova to uh, Nazarbayeva. Uh, and it was, people had talked about for years how um, the street, which was um, one of the very few streets named after, uh, it, the Soviet era street name that was not af named after a Kazakh that hadn't been changed. The others are Shevchenko and Pushkin, so I think they're, they're probably safe. But um, Furmanov uh, was a, a civil war uh, figure in, in Central Asia. And there was a lot of speculation that the reason the name hadn't been changed was because ultimately it was be going to become Nazarbayev. Um, and I think it's very similar in that people expected it to happen, but they were kind of surprised by the timing. Um, I would say um, the fact that they've changed the name of the capital is probably a ref reflection and uh, underscores the broader fact that um, Nazarbayev isn't, you know, isn't going anywhere. He's still very much um, engaged. Uh, very involved in the political process and still uh, maintains a very important um, position uh, in the country. Um, so I think, if anything, it, it, it's interesting, right, because it's it's a change, but it's kind of change as an assertion of stability. Mm -hmm. Do you see it changing again in the future? I don't know. I think it's, um, a, it's hard to predict. There's actually uh, a petition um, uh, to, to stop the name change, uh, and people are arguing that there should be a referendum since it's the capital that people should have personal input. Um, but um, yeah, they're, they're, it's interesting. I think people have, uh, uh, I think people were taken aback by the fact that it happened so quickly. Um, but yeah, uh, and there were a lot of concerns raised about uh, the cost. Um, because since you're renaming the capital, presumably you have to, um, though uh, I guess the government has issued statements saying that that's actually not going to be too bad. You don't have to change your driver's license or anything that has your address. Um, and then there's also concern about kind of the brand that uh, so much effort has been put into promoting the brand of Astana. But. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we have microphones around the room, so just raise your hand. Uh, I'll call on you. Introduce yourself. Affiliation. Question with a question mark. First bill. Thanks for a fascinating talk. Uh, I'm Bill Veal, uh, President Emeritus of the U.S. Kazakhstan Business Association, which I ran for 15 years, from 99 to uh, 14. Um, I wanted to, you mentioned uh, Omsk, and um, I remember, I think there was a little uh, uh, kind of jousting conversation between Yeltsin and Nazarbayev about northern Kazakhstan really being Russian and Nazarbayev rebuts that while saying, what about uh, Omsk? And that ended the conversation and whatnot. So I noticed that Omsk is out of the uh, administrative area of uh, 
of Kazakhstan here. But um, I, I wanted to ask, uh, with that as a sort of background to this, the, the broader idea of, and a very fuzzy psychological sort of idea, of Kazakhstan having been a nomadic society. And um, this very small elite that you ha have uh, talked about uh, moving from one capital to another. Um, have you any reason to believe that this is any kind of subsurface sort of nomadic uh, psychological strain at work here? I mean, in terms of moving around uh, this way, or is that just uh, <laughs> just fuzz? <laughs> um, I think it's uh, it's an interesting kind of coincidence. Um, I think it the the fact that Kazakhstan um, or that that Kazakh society was nomadic predominantly for so long um, was very still yes. Um, uh, that's part of the reason why it was so difficult to find a capital, <laughs> um, because there were no major urban centers. Um, but it's funny because it's not something that's kind of talked about explicitly uh, in party records, because you know nomadism is not something they were very enthusiastic <laughs> about. <laughs> so, great. Uh, we had Natalie here. Just oh, okay. Why don't you give the the mic to the gentleman here, and we'll just go around. Go ahead. Hi, Bill Whitting, private citizen, um, with with strong interest in Kazakhstan. Um, you didn't say anything about the pre-Soviet era. Um, I just did a little searching because I didn't know uh, what the capital of that region was during the Tsarist era. And according to what I found quickly, um, the capital, such as it was of that region at that time, was Semipalatinsk, north of Astana, or Nursultan. Um, and I wondered, I mean, it, it would just stand to reason that the Soviets, trying to establish themselves, why didn't they just build on what was already there and put the capital where the capital had been all along? Why did they move it all the way to the western end of the country, Orenburg? Um, so um, the territory that became Kazakhstan actually had never been unified as one administrative unit really until 1924. Um, even within the Russian Empire, um, it was under different um, parts of the imperial administration. So um, what's now southern Kazakhstan uh, was um, part of uh, Turkestan, which was administered out of Tashkent, and uh, the rest was part of what was called uh, Stepnoy Krai, which um, was administered out of Semipalatinsk. Uh, the problem with Semipalatinsk uh, for the Bolsheviks was uh, it was considered um, it, it, it came up in the discussions. The reason Orenburg initially became the capital was because it was where they had military control um, and where uh, the military headquarters for that region was uh, in 1919, because um, that's just kind of how the Civil War worked out. Uh, but Semipalatinsk um, is kind of in, in the extreme north. It's also associated um, pretty closely with uh, the pre-revolutionary nationalist movement, Alash, and um, I've never really seen anything definitively that would prove this, but a lot of people argue that they were wary of Semipalatinsk for that reason, because of its um, because it was kind of a, a base for uh, the pre-revolutionary intelligentsia, who actually militarily opposed the Bolsheviks uh, until 1919. Great. Uh, go to Natalie. Thank you very much, Natalie Belsky, Cannon Fellow. Um, I. I was wondering if, you know, at, the, at the beginning when you discussed the criticisms of Orenborg, the, one of the criticisms was it's not Cossack enough, right? Like there's no, um, at the, like how, how do you, um, how do we reconcile that with the later considerations that you mentioned are largely technocratic and not, not really about, um, not really so much about nation building, right? When we're talking about the move from Xeroda uh, to Almata, uh, to Almata um, is there, do you see some kind of consideration of what's Kazakh about each different place, and how? Do, what does that tell us about perceptions of Kazakhness among the elite? Um, so I think the the complaints about the city not being sufficiently Kazakh are actually a reflection of the fact that they were unhappy there to begin with, and had it not been for these other factors, they probably could have dealt with it. Um, they, you know, they could have established institutions and um, 
just by nature of the fact that it was the center, there you would have more Kazakhs coming in. Um, but also, I mean, it, it reflects the fundamental fact that you had this pre-existing kind of Russian proletariat and Russian party organization that was entrenched in the city. So um, I think to an extent, the, the complaints about Kazakhness are complaints about um, kind of the, the obstacles they faced specifically in Orenburg. And those obstacles didn't really exist elsewhere uh, in the other, the other places they were considering. Um, so Kizilarda was much more of a blank slate. Um, and uh, Alma Ata was also, it, uh, it, wasn't, it was a bigger city, but it did have um, a Kazakh presence and a, a strong Kazakh presence kind of outside the city as well. So it was, um, it, it just kind of made more sense as a Kazakh place. Hi, I'm Ron Bookbinder, interested in the former Soviet Union, no affiliation. Um, my question is related to Natalie's. The uh, reasons given were very s dramatic. Like, were there literally no Kazakhs in Orenburg? Uh, were there ca dead cats and dogs <laughs> covering the streets in the second capital? Um, and third capital is, I've never been to Almaty. Uh, is it? Paradise on Earth. <laughs> I'm just curious, you know, were these all hyperbole mm -hmm. or were there was actually facts behind them? What we call a no-win question. <laughs> Go ahead. So Almaty is very nice, I have to say, uh, having spent a lot of time there. Um, it's beautifully situated right at the foot of the mountains. Um, uh, you can go skiing. You can go hiking. It's great. Um, and uh, it, it does have a much more mild climate than either Xilarda or um, Astana. Um, and... Um, in terms of the uh, the kind of unsanitary conditions, uh, I think there there is a lot to it. I mean, I think it, it's pretty telling that they wrote about this in the newspaper. Um, but it was also written up um, by, uh, for instance, a, a commission uh, called by um, the Commissariat for Labor, and they were kind of listing all of the problems um, uh, and kind of explaining why it was a difficult place to work um, and difficult to attract people. And it's also reflected in um, the kind of incentive structure they tried to introduce to encourage people to move there. Um, so they would um, get more money. Their, their children could study anywhere in the Soviet Union. Uh, if they died, their families would get like extra pensions. So, um, so it, it does seem to have been objectively not a great place to be. Um, and then uh, I think that it is an exaggeration to say there were literally no Kazakhs in Orenburg, but um, there weren't. Um, so, for instance, in Tashkent, there actually were pre-revolutionary cultural institutions associated um, with Kazakhs. Uh, in other places, uh, you know, the, there were pre-revolutionary journals that had been published in other cities, but um, there wasn't anything like that in Orenburg. Thanks very much, Marisha. Uh, my name's uh, James McSpadden. I'm at the German Historical Institute. Um, and my question's about uh, if you could reflect on what happens to a city after it loses its status as a capital. So when the capital moves away, for example, from or Orenburg, is this a huge blow? Uh, so think about the capitals you talk about in, so in Soviet uh, Kazakhstan, but I'm actually more interested thinking of moves in Germany from Bonn to Berlin after the Cold War, from Almaty to Astana. What's um, Bonn? No, I'm kidding. Yeah, exactly. So, so in Germany, the solution was, well, we're going to put some of the ministries there. And it's still officially the rule, but they're moving more and more and more people to Berlin. over. over. So, so what happens when you lose your status as a capital? Do you really fall from grace? Uh, or do, is, there a, uh, is there a rebirth? Bonn tried to do it by attracting the UN, for example, but that's not really been that successful. <laughs> Um, so, uh, Orenburg authorities, I think, were very happy to no longer be the capital of Kazakhstan. Uh, and in fact, not just Orenburg, but the entire area kind of was excised from Kazakhstan. Um, and, you know, I think they're doing fine in southern Russia. Um, but Kizilardad, yeah, it really kind of, I mean, it's, a, it's still, you know, it's a city, it's a, a provincial capital, um, but it's not, um, you know, a major city. Um, there's not all that much there, apparently. I've actually never been. Uh, I considered going, uh, but it turns out that all of the archival materials were relocated uh, to Almaty, so uh, I got to spare myself the trip. Um, uh, and then Almaty, I think, by virtue of the fact that it, it was the capital for so long, um, it 
maintains a certain status um, in Kazakhstan. A lot of cultural institutions are still there. Um, so the Academy of Sciences, for instance, is based in Almaty. Um, the archives are in Almaty, which is lucky for me. Um, and uh, yeah, so it, you know, the, the, there are museums, there are all these things that kind of were built up over the, the course of its time as the capital. Um, and it's still considered kind of a cultural center. Um, but I think that that is by virtue of the fact that, you know, Almaty was the capital from 1929 to uh, 1997, whereas Kizladada was the capital for like, a couple of years. So. All right, we'll take the final question right here. Uh, ben Loring, I'm also a private citizen. Um, I wanted to ask about subnational identities and specifically um, the uh, whether there w in the in the course of these two moves during the Soviet era, whether uh, local elites in other candidate cities kind of pitched their cities among, as particularly the national elites, and whether these reflected kind of national sub subnational groupings within uh, Kazakhstan. Or um, was this uh, kind of a more of a purely regional identity, or, or, or um, did identity just not play any role, and everybody, e including the national elites, were just looking at the practicalities? Um, so it's a it's a really interesting question because um, I personally have never seen anything from kind of a lower level um, advocating for one city or another. Um, there is, to some extent, um, y you know, the, you you see that some people kind of argued for cities uh, in the regions that they were from. Um, but for instance, with Tashkent, like everyone was behind Tashkent. Um, it wasn't just uh, Kazakhs from Turkestan. Um, though it was a group of Kazakhs from Turkestan who pr first proposed Kizilarda as a possibility. Um, so it, it seems to have been maybe a, a factor in informing kind of the range of possibilities, but um, it doesn't seem to have been decisive in terms of the actual decision making. You know, I'm reminded as I look at the maps and think about the railroad line uh, arguments that, that you mentioned and um, some of the natural geography that, uh, you know, as time goes on, it's more and more evident the impact that human uh, settlement on the surface of the earth actually has on the shape of the planet. And I really wonder if it's, we probably don't have them going back far enough, but if we had photos from space of the center of Eurasia, we could probably see all of these different historical epochs in terms of lights and infrastructure and the Aral Sea, which exists on this map, but barely exists anymore. I mean, it's, it's actually not just names on a map and kind of the impressions of mortal human beings. It's actually a permanent change in the surface of the Earth as a result of these decisions. So just to underscore the importance of this in a cosmic sense, <laughs> um, will you all please join me in thanking uh, Maria and congratulating her once again. Thank you very much.